morning. Let's see if we can get this to play. I'm glad that uh, Dr. Sandberg went first. He kind of laid the groundwork for um, some of what I'm going to talk about. Fairly similar uh, topic. While that's loading, uh, I'm at the University of Alabama, Children's of Alabama. Um, I'm currently uh, in my residency. Um, some of my faculty asked me to present as they were en route to the ISBN and uh, couldn't be here themselves. So hopefully I can uh, well represent uh, their views and practice patterns and some of the views that I've developed as well um, during my training. Um, so I'm going to be talking about kind of a similar group of patients that Dr. Sandberg did, um, patients with what we would call a benign Chiari 1 malformation. Um, and so objectives of my talk are shown here, kind of what understanding what exactly a benign Chiari is, what are what we consider clinical indications for decompression, what the course is of patients with uh, benign Chiari malformation. We have no disclosures. Uh, I'd really like to thank my co-authors, the other researchers who helped me with this. Uh, I've been supported uh, by the UAB Women's Leadership Council as a clinical research scholar. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody at Children's of Alabama, UAB, and of course the CSF uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, so. Kind of as alluded to <clears throat> by Dr. Sandberg, there have been several noteworthy studies um, kind of reviewing the prevalence of Chiari 1 malformation uh, in the general public. And uh, what's been reported is somewhere between 0.6 and 3.6% of patients that have uh, an MRI for another reason will be found to have a Chiari 1 malformation. And as more and more brain MRIs are being performed, we can expect to find more and more Chiari 1 malformations. And so, as Dr. Sandberg alluded, you know, one of the obvious challenges uh, in managing these patients lies in the fact that many are asymptomatic and many have symptoms which may be attributable to a Chiari 1 malformation, but there are also symptoms that are very common in the general population, like headache, migraine headache, et cetera. Uh, there are certain findings, as we all know, that are strongly associated with Chiari malformation and uh, that uh, typically improve after surgical decompression. And so based on the experience of uh, the surgeons at Children's of Alabama, uh, we have a fairly regimented approach to Chiari 1 malformation, um, thanks mainly to Dr. Oakes and his, his vast experience. Uh, and so typically we offer uh, surgical decompression for patients with valsalva-induced occipital headache, if they have a focal cranial nerve uh, palsy, if they have objective evidence of central sleep apnea on sleep study, other focal neurologic symptoms, uh, or uh, syringomyelia or syrinx. Um, and you know, Dr. Sandberg kind of brought up the, the population of patients with very small um, syrinx and otherwise asymptomatic. Um, I'll just say that generally patients with syrinx, uh, we recommend uh, surgical decompression. So we define benign Chiari 1 malformation as a patient with minimal or no symptoms no syrinx, no hydrocephalus, no spinal cord signal change. Um, in, in short, no classical indication for surgical decompression. And so building on some of the studies that Dr. Sandberg mentioned, uh, the purpose of our study was to evaluate the clinical course of these patients with benign Chiari 1 uh, and you know, how often do they go on to develop symptoms uh, or imaging findings that warrant uh, surgical decompression. So uh, to do that, I was fortunate to have a fairly vast experience at Children's of Alabama. Uh, we initially identified about 1,700 patients with a possible uh, Chiari diagnosis. 
Um, many were excluded because they either weren't seen by a neurosurgeon, they didn't have a diagnosis of Chiari 1, so they had a diagnosis of Chiari 2 or Dandy Walker or something else. Um, they had already undergone surgery at another institution. Uh, they had a syrinx at their first appointment, uh, or they had no follow-up. Um, we also wanted to exclude those patients that we recommended surgery for. Uh, and to do that, we excluded patients that had that underwent surgery within nine months of their initial evaluation. And the reason that we did that was that if we saw a patient, we recommended surgery, typically they would undergo surgery within three or four months. If we didn't recommend surgery, our practice is to see patients in follow-up in one year. And so to allow for patients that may have been seen a month or two early, um, we chose nine months as our, as our cutoff. Uh, so then, of the remaining 444 patients, we did very detailed chart review, um, and there were 17 additional patients that were excluded um, because even though they didn't undergo surgery, they had symptoms at presentation that would typically uh, prompt us to recommend surgery, uh, and those are shown here. And so that left uh, 427 patients with uh, so-called benign Chiari malformation that we followed. Um, and so looking at our study, uh, the mean uh, follow-up duration uh, was about three years. Uh, most patients, the average age was about eight and a half years. The majority of patients were male, uh, white, and had private insurance. This histogram shows the range of follow-up duration. <clears throat> uh, over 300 patients had at least one year of follow-up, and over 100 patients had at least five years of follow-up. Again, the uh, average was about three years. So how many patients uh, eventually went on to have surgery? 15 in our cohort of 427, which is an absolute rate of about 3.5%. Um, the median time to surgery was just under two years, and the indications for surgery are shown here, and it's important to note that some patients had more than one of these. Um, so the most common indications for surgery were tussive headache or development of syrinx. Uh, there were some patients that had non-tussive headache that had surgery. Uh, three patients developed a focal cranial nerve palsy, uh, one patient had central sleep apnea, uh, et cetera. So, uh, and then the median postoperative follow-up for those uh, patients who did have surgery was uh, about three years. As far as which of those patients improved after surgery, all of the patients with tussive headache had resolution of their headache. Uh, three of the five patients with syrinx had complete resolution of their syrinx after surgery. Uh, 60% of the patients with non-tussive headache improved. Uh, only one of the three patients who developed a cranial nerve uh, palsy improved, uh, and both of the patients that had, uh, or the, each of the patients that had extremity uh, weakness and numbness and central sleep apnea, they both improved. So we found in our group about 1% risk of development of a new syrinx. Uh, if there was no syrinx, uh, and none of these patients that did develop syrinx had a dilated central canal or other pre-syrinx state. Uh, they were all truly uh, negative uh, images. Uh, this is an example of a boy uh, that presented when he was four years old. He had vague complaints of fatigue, and after he would play all day in the afternoon, he said his legs were tired, um, but he didn't have any headaches. He had a normal neurologic exam, uh, and his MRI on the left was his uh, initial MRI. We opted to follow him. He was seen in follow-up. Uh, we typically do get follow-up uh, cervical MRIs, and he developed a not subtle syrinx. Uh, and so we recommended surgery for him, and his family agreed, uh, agreed to do that. Um, so this is another uh, case of a patient who did uh, undergo surgery. Uh, this is uh, another youngster <clears throat> that 
initially um, presented with uh, no symptoms. I think he had, an Im uh, he had imaging after he hit his head at a birthday party and had some persistent headache and vomiting uh, after the party, and so he was imaged. 14 months uh, after we first saw him, he started complaining of occipital headache, and he was also noted to have a fairly classic sixth nerve palsy. Um, it, he was also evaluated by ophthalmology. There wasn't another etiology for the sixth nerve palsy identified, and so we did recommend surgery. Uh, his headaches completely resolved with surgery. He still had some disconjugate gaze uh, and an intermittent sixth nerve palsy after surgery, though. Uh, and then a uh, final case of a teenager who was one of the 15 who went on to, to have surgery. She started, or she presented to us as a tween, I think she was 12 or 13, with severe migraine headaches. Uh, she had a family history of migraine headaches. Uh, our Chiari clinic is staffed by both a pediatric neurosurgeon and a pediatric headache neurologist. Uh, and so she was managed for several years by our headache neurologist, uh, but really had no significant change in her, her migraine headache. Four years after we first saw her, she had a marked change in the character of her headache. She developed essentially a new headache type that was occipital and tussive in nature. And so we recommended surgery. She had surgery, uh, and her tussive occipital headache resolved completely, and she continued to have uh, her other migraine-like headaches. Uh, to account for patients and their variable follow-up, uh, we did a Kaplan-Meier survival analysis uh, for freedom from Chiari decompression. So patients who present with a benign Chiari malformation in, in our experience, 95.8% um, would be without mm -hmm. surgery at three years, 94% at five years, and 93% at 10 years. Uh, so, you know, six to 7% uh, likelihood of developing classical symptoms or other imaging findings that would warrant surgical decompression. We also did multivariate analysis, um, but there was no significant relationship between need for surgery with uh, sex, age, gender, insurance status, et cetera. Uh, so kind of discussing uh, our results, especially in context of what Dr. Sandberg said, our, our results support the notion that uh, Chiari 1 malformations that are benign at presentation likely will remain so uh, for a long period of time. I'd also like to draw some attention to the proportion of patients that we saw in Chiari clinic with a benign Chiari. Uh, it, was, it was somewhere between 50 and 70 percent. And of course, you know, the patients that make it to a, a Chiari clinic or a pediatric neurosurgeon, there are going to be more patients who end up requiring surgery. Um, than not, but still more than half of patients had a benign Chiari malformation. And I think that's you know, important to, to remember that most patients with Chiari probably don't need surgery. Uh, so in our practice, we recommend surgery primarily based on clinical symptoms uh, and not just imaging findings, as impressive as some Chiari malformations can be. Uh, David went over all of this, so I won't uh, belabor the point. Um, our findings are pretty consistent with uh, the published literature. Uh, our, this manuscript has been accepted and will be published in JNSP uh, soon uh, and will join these other groups that have found uh, similar results. The one difference between some of the, between these studies and ours is a significant number of patients in these studies included patients who had a syrinx at presentation. Uh, and so that might explain <clears throat> some of why their, uh, their rates of needing surgery were, were a little bit higher. Uh, the most significant limitation of our study, this was a retrospective review. There were a large number of patients that were seen once in our clinic and never followed up. Uh, and you know our results would be significantly altered if a large number of those patients 
didn't follow up because they went on, saw a different surgeon who did offer surgery. It's really hard to know whether those patients did that or they were never seen again because they remained asymptomatic. And so uh, just in conclusion, uh, it, based on our experience, benign Chiari malformation is one that's asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Uh, that's a very common entity. It's uncommon for those patients to uh, progress in symptoms or imaging findings uh, that would uh, warrant surgery, but follow-up is justified because it's not zero. Uh, and again, we reserve surgery for patients with life-dominating tussive headache, cranial nerve dysfunction, syrinx, or focal neurologic deficit. Um, there, you know, future research may certainly identify I think someone asked, you know, as far as degree of tonsillar descent or other imaging findings, uh, one of the things that we're doing now for these 427 patients is reviewing all of their imaging at presentation uh, and, you know, to see if we can identify any specific imaging features that uh, are correlated with development of future symptoms or development of syrinx. And that's all I have for you this morning. I'd uh, entertain any questions. Thank you.